you know, just, just being in the ministry and uh, things like that, um, I'm more aware of these things, but I've served in Korean churches and American churches, and um, I think this is more common uh, in Korean churches, but it's also definitely very common, pretty, pretty normal in American churches too, but the number of people, how many people they can get in, it's really, really huge. Like, it's like, I mean, I hate the language of success, but that's pretty much um, the, the concept and uh, language. Well, yeah, even language for like pastoral ministry, how successful your ministry is. It's how many people you get, uh, how, how, much, um, how much bigger you make your church. And which is, to be honest and, and re real candid, is pathetic. But like that is uh, the reality. Um, now, the reason that is the case and that, well, the reason that can be the case and that is the case is because uh, when you live in a, a context where, like I, like I said in the introduction, where there's no cost, like you don't get persecuted for being a Christian, uh, it's freedom of religion you have then you can have churches all over the place wherever because uh you have the freedom of religion and uh, there's no cost and it's not like illegal like in some countries it's, it's like literally illegal to be a christian like the government or you know other muslims people of other religions will come and attack you things like that uh, in those kinds of settings not only do you not have many churches but even if you do you're much more likely to team up together and protect each other and help each other out Versus if you're in a context where that's not at all the case, there's this competition thing of getting more people in. Now, I'm not saying that's the case with everyone. I'm not saying that, but that's very common. That's just the reality. And, you know, we hear the language of like church, uh, church hopping or church shopping where like it's almost like, you know, choosing a car or choosing a house or whatever. Um, you're free to just choose whatever church, which that, that part, yeah, that, that, of course, you wanna be discerning and choose the right church, yeah, but the point is like, there are lots of churches all over the place, and uh, so there's that, you know, like I said, there's that kind of competition kind of thing of getting people in, and there's the thing of um, church growth method. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure, there, I'm, I would not, I would be surprised if, there, there were no seminaries that taught like, uh, I think, what do you call that? Uh, how to get people in, church growth methods, stuff like that. Uh, there's a pastor, I, I almost don't even want to call him pastor, but there's like this pastor man, um, I think in the East Coast somewhere, uh, who, this is I think maybe a couple decades ago, maybe more, uh, but he, um, he wanted to grow his church. And so what he did is he did a like survey of the people in, in the city of like, what kind of church do you want? What kind of church do you want? What do you prefer? Uh, and basically it's what would get people into the church. And um, based on the research or the survey he did, he um, structured his church, quote unquote church, um, to fit that so that people would come in and that became like a mega church with like tens of thousands of people um which is just again beyond ridiculous um, because if you know anything of the bible like new testament like revelation 2 and 3 for example pretty pretty vital important passage the key thing is as one pastor has said there's only one seeker so they, they call it seeker friendly basically you adjust everything to the seekers so that people come in, people come and your church grows. But as one pastor says, uh, there's only one seeker and his name is God. And so if you wanna do anything according to um, the seeker, that's the only one you need to pay attention to. And that's biblically true. Jesus says in Revelation 2 to the church of Ephesus, if you don't repent of leaving your first love, I'm going to remove your lampstand from its place. You're no, no longer going to be a church. That's pretty important. Uh, Jesus is the one that determines whether you're even a church or not. 
And, you know, the first church of Ephesus, he says, you know, this is good. Your perseverance, you hold fast to my name. Uh, your works are good. These things are good, good, good. He doesn't say that, but he basically is commending them for these good things. But he says, but I have this against you, uh, singular, I have this against you. You have left your first love, repent. Otherwise, I'm going to come to you and I'm going to remove the lampstand from its place unless you repent. So when you like know those things, like it's not about like adjusting everything to what people want. It's what does my Lord say, the head of the church? And he's the only one you have in mind when it comes to how a church should be. What does he say about a church? It's his flock that he's entrusted me or us to, the pastors. And I'm to watch over his flock. Like the, after the introduction, this little paragraph, role of a pastor, elder overseer. Uh, the, the word pastor is literally a shepherd. It's just the same Greek word. Uh, leaders of churches to whom local churches are entrusted to oversee God's flock with fear and trembling by being examples and teaching and leading with authority, that's biblical, authority given by Christ to whom the church belongs. And uh, like the John 21 passages, remember when Jesus is restoring Peter, Peter, do you love me? Oh, Lord, you know that I love you. Uh, like feed my sheep. Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Uh, like shepherd my lambs or it's a different Greek word, but it's saying the same thing. You feed my sheep, shepherd my sheep, feed my lambs three times. I, you know, when I'm in that passage, I, I, it, it, it makes you teary eyed if you really know what he's talking about. Jesus is, Jesus says, feed my sheep. They're my sheep. Now you take care of them. So if a pastor really knows the role of a pastor, it's a fearful thing because this is not your sheep. This is Jesus' sheep that he loves so much. And so that's why it's supposed to really um, make you terrified in a way that I am entrusted with his sheep, his flock. Now, in a way, I'm also part of the flock. If you're a Christian, you are, but uh, you're entrusted. And so those passages, um, Acts 20, 28, 1 Timothy 3, 1 Peter 5, passages about like, um, like Acts 20 is like when Paul's with the elders, he says, uh, take heed to yourselves, pay attention or take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has appointed you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with the blood of his own. So it's the church of God. So shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood, or it can be the blood of his own, the blood of his son, basically. So you are shepherding the church of God, it's his church, you are to shepherd. And the same kind of thing in like First Peter, uh, where Peter says the same thing, that they've been entrusted to you. He's speaking to the elders. And I already read, I already quoted John 21, feed my sheep, feed my lambs, shepherd them. So yeah, um, if a pastor like knows I mean, this is basic, like with all seriousness, this is very basic. Um, you're not going to have in mind this ridiculous church growth, uh, ministry success. Like, I don't like that language and concept, bringing that kind of stuff in. But if there's any ministry success, it's having been faithful and having been as biblical as possible in pastoring, shepherding God's flock. That's it. It's not about, oh, how large you grew your church, because the reality is, whether in Korean Christianity or American Christianity, there's so many circles where, like, one of the top things and pressures and the success or not, success or failure thing is, do you have a big church or not? 
Now, if, if anyone is like in the ministry or like around pastors, they know this, that sometimes you can get fired if you don't do a good job growing your youth group or growing your uh, church. Um, yeah, but uh, biblically, uh, like you, you can be, you can be very, very faithful and the church grows in number. That's totally fine and good. But you can be very, very faithful and biblical and number wise, it doesn't grow. That's totally fine. The Lord would not have any problem. He's just counting. Are you going to be biblical and faithful? And there are quote unquote churches where it can be thousands or tens of thousands of people with church growth method and, you know, um, tickling people's ears. Second Timothy four, that in the last days, they're going to have itching ears and they, they're going to heap up for themselves teachers that'll uh, that'll scratch their itching ears with fables and stuff like that. Um, and that, as we probably know, it's all over the place. And um, I mean, Joe Osteen would be just one of many examples where uh, it, that kind of stuff goes on. But, uh, well, and, and one of the key things is when you want to uh, grow your church, when that's like your goal, like I said, you water down things so that people are willing to join. But see, when you're in um, countries like the Middle East or places in Africa or, you know, in China, um, that kind of idea doesn't exist. Like, dude, the government may crack down on us and we can go to prison. You don't have, what's church growth? What the heck is that? Are you, are you kidding me? Like, there's no such thing. There's no such thing in the Bible, and there's no such thing like that in um, in such context. It's just uh, if someone's gonna be a Christian and join a church, like if you get caught, you're gonna be in trouble. And um, like in these countries, like many times, they have to be very careful because sometimes there are spies that come in that the government can send. Um, they act like they're interested in Christian or act, act like they're interested in Christianity or the church. Um, but they join just to be like a spy from the government or among Muslims so that they can spy out, okay, who's a member and get the, get their names and report it. That goes on. So there's just no room for any of this foolish things. So what is, what should be the goal? So I'll just read the introduction. So what is the role of a pastor or pastors and what goals should they or he, he or they have with the church? While in regions in the world where there isn't persecution and there's no cost in being a Christian, the numerical growth of the church is one of the key factors in judging whether they were successful or not. And goals a lot of pastors have. Biblically, so while that's the case, biblically, what are supposed to be the goals those who pastor a church should have? Today we will go into the Bible to see what the goals of pastors are supposed to be. So, yeah, um, the other day I was just uh, just kind of about to have a time of prayer. And then as soon as I just got on in my bed, just before the Lord, I just got the 2 Corinthians 11 that just kind of, in a way, kind of flooded me. Just uh, It just... I guess the Holy Spirit just, I don't know. I don't know how to explain it. Um, like, I guess in a way bringing the passage alive again, just like um, hitting me with that passage and just, yeah, getting it, inspiring me with that passage. Uh, so 2 Corinthians 11, Daniel seems to be um, ready to read. If you wanna. <laughs> I just pulled it up. Uh, do you want me to read? Verse one. Yeah, no, no. Uh, one, two, three. I hope you will put up with me in a little foolishness. Yes, please put up with me. I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy. I promised you to one husband, to Christ, so that I might present you as a pure virgin to him. But I am afraid that just as Eve was deceived by the serpent's cunning, your minds may somehow be led astray from your sincere and pure devotion to Christ. Thank you. Um, so, 
a little context if you know second corinthians um the main issue was false apostles uh that had come in and that's why in verse four for if someone comes and preaches another jesus whom we have not preached or if you receive a different spirit which you have not received or a different gospel which you have not accepted you put up with it well so right there uh it's indicating that this kind of thing is going on and this is the false apostles and if you look at verse five for i consider that i am not at all inferior to the quote-unquote super apostles he's talking about those you know quote-unquote apostles uh, false apostles that uh, infiltrated the church and were leading a lot of people astray and that's why we see this tone here and why he says this he says oh that you would bear with me in a little foolishness uh so foolishness is also kind of a minor topic the false apostles and some in the church that were opposing paul lightly regarded paul and would have been like ridiculing they were like ridiculing and de demeaning um apostle paul like so many times uh you can get hints of it based on what paul says why paul brings up certain things so yeah oh that you would bear with me in a little foolishness because basically they were judging him to be like foolish or things like that and indeed you do bear with me now here <clears throat> starting here for i am jealous for you with i don't like this godly jealousy uh i think jealousy of god is more correct based on the context and language literally you can just put it as jealousy of god and that's why um a lot of translations do have godly jealousy but e esv for example and like rsv i feel a divine jealousy for you that's what it says i feel a divine jealousy for you so i, I think jealousy of god is better because i mean godly jealousy sounds like some holy like godly like devoted jealousy so i, I think that's okay like incorrect so i think paul is saying that he has the jealousy of god uh now what what's this jealousy thing well what comes to your mind when it comes to jealousy in the bible like good jealousy well god says that he is a jealous god i think we know that he says his name is jealous he's jealous over his people so when you have when you know that background that would be that is what paul is talking about because remember again the false apostles are leading, leading them astray and paul he's jealous for them with god's jealousy and he explains more for i have betrothed you guys to one husband that i may present you as a chaste virgin to christ see paul he is he's not really the pastor in a way but i mean he is kind of the pastor but he's definitely the father of this church uh first corinthians 4. paul you know that that passage where he says like you have you have ten thousand instructors for though you you might have ten thousand instructors in christ yet you do not have many fathers for in christ jesus i have begotten you through the gospel i have birthed you i have become your father through the gospel so that language and concept you know it's it's an amazing fascinating uh concept so paul is the one that uh, birthed these corinthians through the gospel so just like how women bear children um, they birth children and they're born when it comes to pe people becoming christians there's a new birth they're born again they're regenerated and so whether men or women if you're a christian you can birth children through the gospel when you lead them to christ that's what that's where that comes from in first Corinthians 4. Um, that's why he says though you may have ten thousand instructions in christ you don't have many fathers for i am basically your father so paul is uh their spiritual parent he birthed them which is amazing it's an amazing concept 
But um, sadly, these false apostles led them astray. And uh, his goal, like he says, is I have betrothed you guys to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. So this is one of the things that pastors um, are supposed to have in mind. That this church that I'm entrusted with, that we elders are entrusted with, like it says right here, you know, remember, as we know, the church is the bride of Christ. And see the background. When you go to Joseph, Mary, uh, Jesus, Matthew 1, they were betrothed. It's, it's not like engagement. It's much more uh, permanent and firm than engagement as we, you know, I'm, I'm sure we heard it many times during Christmas season, but... When you're betrothed, you need a divorce certificate. You got to divorce each other if you want to end it. That's how firm it is. But while you're betrothed, you don't come near each other. I mean, I don't know, maybe they can come near, but like you don't come together in any way, like with any intimacy. For about a year, even though you're betrothed, you stay away from each other. And that's exactly what we see with uh, Joseph and Mary. And remember when, remember that's when Joseph hears the news that, you know, Mary would have sent the news that she's pregnant. And that would have been like shocking because what happens is you're betrothed, you're going to marry and the man goes away many times, you know, making money and things like that, preparing a place for them to live in. Uh, does that sound familiar? Anything with the church? Uh, so they're betrothed, but the uh, man, he goes away. And then about a year later, he kind of comes back to get her out of nowhere. Uh, I heard that that's how it worked. It's a surprise thing. Does that sound familiar? So during that time, the bride, she's just waiting. And she would be eagerly waiting. She would be kind of, you know, probably preparing herself. Um, of course, she's remaining pure. Uh, as a virgin and that's exactly what Paul has in mind right here so Christ he birthed the church and the church and Christ are in this uh, betrothal period Christ has gone away but he's gonna come back to get his bride and during that time the church we are remaining pure of course this is spiritually I mean physically too but um, this applies spiritually just like the uh, the bride that's going to get married any day, she remains pure. You know, she has in mind her husband, or maybe not husband yet, in a way husband, but she has him in mind. She doesn't have, like, other men in mind, right? She's just looking forward to this hubby that's going to come any day. So, yeah, the bride is... Uh, eagerly looking forward to him coming back and she is just um, remaining pure and that's exactly what the church is at we're waiting for the groom to come and like it says right here I have betrothed you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ so of course spiritually just just like you know physically like a bride a chaste virgin and getting married pure the church spiritually a chaste virgin to be married and so this is uh, what Apostle Paul says and this is what's supposed to be the case with uh, you know pastors that this is one of the things that they work on the, the one of the one of their goals is this very thing for the church to be devoted, eagerly waiting for the Lord's return. You know, one of the things you can ask is, how much is this church looking forward to the Lord's return? Like, that's a very, like, basic, basic thing. And because, I mean, with all seriousness, like, in America, people are so content and having enough fun that Jesus' return, it's not even on their mind. Which is ridiculous, biblically. Because all over the New Testament, all over the place, Jesus' return, Jesus' return, uh, the day, the day, 
um, you, you just still have that in mind. Just like a bride that's waiting for the groom. So that kind of eager waiting, you know, Jesus warned over and over about watch, watch, watch. You don't know when, the day or the hour. He's going to come like a thief in the night all over the place, it says. Jesus goes into that very thing in one of the churches in Revelation 3. The first church in Revelation 3, I think, is the church of Sardis that you're not watching. And I'm going to come like a thief in the night. He warns them. So uh, the church eagerly waiting, anticipating, they're staying awake. And, you know, again, just like the, just like the, the, the bride, they don't have anyone else in mind, okay? I mean, th think about how sad it would be. The, the woman is betrothed, but like, you know, I mean, modern day, you know, applicate or modern day context, like maybe they're like checking other men out on the internet or something. Like, think about how sad that is. Like, the norm is, you just have in mind that one hubby to be, <laughs> I just rhymed, um, that, that man that's going to be your husband. You're just looking forward to him. And now spiritually, uh, this can be um, like idolatry stuff. Okay, so remember in the Old Testament, Old Testament background, Israel and God, many times... God uses the image of a prostitute. You see it in Ezekiel like two, three times. Jeremiah. Um, you see it in many places. Uh, well, there's like, for example, in Jeremiah 2, moreover, the word of the Lord came to me saying, Go and cry in the hearing of Jerusalem, saying, Thus says the Lord, I remember you, the kindness of your youth, the love of your betrothal, when you followed me in the wilderness. In a land not sown, Israel was holy to the Lord. The first fruits of his harvest, all that devoured him, will offend. So you see like betrothal language. Jeremiah chapter 3. They say if a man divorces his wife and she goes from him and becomes another man's, may he return to her again? Would not that land be greatly polluted? But you have played the harlot with many lovers. So what makes you think you can return to me? This one translation or other translation. I get this is difficult to know what it's talking about. But either it's return to me, yet return to me. Or what makes you think you can return to me? So the language. This man divorcing his wife. Can he return to her again? You have played the harlot with many lovers. And then like verse 2. Lift up your eyes to the desolate heights and see where have you not been violated or been immoral? By the road you have sat for them like an Arabian in the wilderness and you have polluted the land with your harlotries and your wickedness. Uh, therefore the showers have been withheld and there have been no latter rain. You have had a harlot's forehead you refuse to be ashamed. So, I mean, th this is just so in so many places. Jeremiah 2, 3, uh, maybe more. Um, and then Ezekiel, like 22, 3, I think Ezekiel um, or 16 also. So many places. And I mean, the whole thing of Hosea, I mean, the whole book of Hosea where God tells Hosea to get a bride who's going to, uh, either who she's already a prostitute or she will become an adulteress but taking her to give the image of Israel who while they are God's bride they have turned to idols so based on that look here's what it is overall um, in you know Second Corinthians 11 3 but I fear lest somehow as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be led astray from the sincere and pure devotion to Christ. That is so huge. So sincere and pure devotion to Christ, that's supposed to be the norm. And I, have, I can have another section for that. Uh, but 
again, the bride, there's a sincere and pure devotion to Christ, that, that groom. But when you start turning your eyes to other men, turning your eyes to other stuff, idolatrous stuff, that is spiritual harlotry. Like in the Old Testament, mainly it's idolatry. In the New Testament too, like candidates are like uh, money, wealth. That's a big one. And that's, that's why like I have uh, Revelation. So if you go to Revelation, uh, like the 14, like un underneath there, uh, under 2 Corinthians 11, you can see Revelation 14. So uh, it speaks about the 144,000. And um, so just real quick, Revelation 14, 1, then I looked and behold, the lamb standing on Mount Zion and with him 144,000 having his father's name written on their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven, like the voice of many waters and like the voice of thunder. And I heard the sound of harpists playing their harps. They sang a new song before the throne, before the four living creatures and the elders. And no one could learn that song except 144,000 who were redeemed from the earth. Verse 4. These are the ones who were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. So here the Im imagery is like, it's implied that they're men, but um, it says that they're virgins. So the same kind of thing you see, and they're not defiled with women. So it uses the sexual, the, uh, the opposite sex thing and sexual purity. Of course, it's speaking spiritually. It's not that you have to be unmarried. We know that this is a spiritual purity. So God's people, how they're virgins, uh, these are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. And um, when it says uh, these were not defiled with women, the defilement, that same Greek word, you can see in Revelation 3, so, remember how just earlier I mentioned Revelation 3 with the Church of Sardis? Well, this is that very church. So, Revelation 3, And to the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things says, He who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars, I know your works, that you have a name that you're alive, but you're dead. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. For I have not found your works complete or completed before my God. In verse 2, as I said before, be watchful. Remember I mentioned that? Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. For I have not found your works completed before my God. Verse 3, remember therefore how you have received and heard. Keep it and repent. Therefore, if you will not watch, I will come upon you as a thief, and you will not know what hour I will come upon you. You have a few names in Sardis who have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. So here, you see the defiled their garments. So here's the same word defiled. And uh, so what is this defilement? Well, just the language itself, you get the thing of um, contaminated or uh, defiled, corrupted. This would be spiritual corruption. And so when it says in Revelation 14 that these are virgins, they're not defiled, it would be spiritual defilement. So what kind of spiritual defilement can there be? Well probably worldly influence, spiritual impurity. Uh, it can be things like idolatry. If in, in Revelation, you know, if you've read Revelation, you know about, um, okay, in Revelation, I, I'm, I'm kind of going a little far here, in, uh, well, but it's beneficial, it's good, but in Revelation, there's a clear, uh, like, polar opposite contrast that, that goes on. So for example, 
you know, we just read that the 144,000, uh, they're spiritually virgins. But then what's the opposite? Uh, harlots. Yeah, so anything come to your mind in Revelation? Babylon, the mother of harlots. Uh, so like Revelation 17 and 18, it comes up many times. Like Revelation 17, then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and talked with me saying, come, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters with whom the kings of the earth committed fornication. Interesting. Hmm, that's exactly the opposite. So committed fornication. And the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness. And I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast, which was full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet. Okay, if you know purple in the Bible, purple is uh, an expensive color. They have to use a certain dye, and it's expensive, and that's why the rich man in Lazarus, remember he was clothed with purple, the rich man? So it indicates much wealth, and you are you see that in chapter 18 too. Wealth is a huge thing, actually. Arrayed in purple and scarlet, and adorned with gold and, let well, I me mean, look at this, gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the filthiness of her fornication. And on her forehead, a name was written. Wait, forehead? Hmm, that kind of sounds familiar. Uh, we just read in chapter 14, when it comes to 144,000, having his, having his name, Jesus' name, and his father's name written on their foreheads. That's the 144,000. But this harlot, on her forehead, a name written. On her forehead, a name was written, a mystery. Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and of the abominations of the earth. So God's people are mar marked out with uh, spiritual virginity. They're spiritually pure. pure. But on the opposite side, the, the Babylon, the great, the mother of harlots, she's a harlot, kings of the earth committing fornication, things like that. So we, we pull her off of stuff. And, and just one more little, one more thing would be, for example, uh, they call it the Trinity. So on the good side, you have God, I mean, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. But on the other side, what do you have on the other side? You have the dragon. And the, the beast, right? Yeah, you have two beasts. And generally they're understood, interpreted as the Antichrist and the false prophet. So there's Satan, the dragon, and um, yeah, the two beasts, like Antichrist and false prophet. So there, there are these two sides like that. But, um, yeah, so God's people are marked out with such uh, purity like that. But on the other side, there's that. And so, like, real quick, if you just go to, like, chapter 18, 18.1. After these things, I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority. And the earth was illuminated with his glory. And he cried with a loud voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become a dwelling place of demons, a prison for every unclean spirit, and a cage for every unclean and hated bird. For all the nations have drunk the wine of the wrath of her fornication. The kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth have become rich through the power of her luxury. Hmm, so you keep getting this image, this thing of uh, riches, wealth, uh, luxury, that kind of stuff. Verse 4, And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins, and lest you receive of her plagues. For her sins have heaped up to heaven, 
and God has remembered her iniquities, render to her just as she rendered, and repay her double according to her works. In the cup which she has mixed, mix double for her. In the measure she has glorified herself and lived luxuriously, in the same measure give her torment and sorrow. For she says in her heart, I sit as queen and am no widow, I will not see sorrow. Therefore her plagues will come in one day, death, mourning, and famine, and she will utterly be burned with fire, for strong is the Lord God who judged her. Okay, did you see in verse 8, what plague will come in one day? Death, mourning, and famine. Exactly the opposite of like prosperous, that kind of thing. And that's made all the more clear. I mean, you just go on verse 9. The kings of the earth who committed fornication and lived luxuriously with her will weep and lament for her when they see the smoke of her burning standing at a distance for fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, the great city Babylon, the mighty city. By the way, the mighty city, hmm, you see Babylon the great, that mighty city, city Babylon, what's on the op opposite side? Jerusalem? Yeah, it's the New Jerusalem. God's people will make up the New Jerusalem. In chapter like 21, 22, it goes into the New Jerusalem. God's people. So there's that, constantly, they have that, two opposites. Um, for in one hour, your, your judgment has come. And then like verse 11, and the merchants of the earth will weep and mourn over her, for no one buys her merchandise anymore. Merchandise of gold, silver, precious stone, pearl, fine linen, on and on. Purple, you see purple again? So I know I'm kind of going in this is a lot, but just the point is one of the at least minor topics is wealth and riches. The caution that comes with that. Let, let me just show you something that's, uh, I don't know if you already know it, but Revelation 2, the second church, Church of Smyrna. Look at uh, chapter 2, verse 8. And to the angel of the church in Smyrna, write, These things says, Jesus, the first and the last, who was dead and came to life. I know your tribulation and poverty but you are rich and then dot 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 and this is a church they have much suffering and they are impoverished Jesus says I know your poverty but you are rich what is that talking about well materially physically you are impoverished but spiritually, you're rich. That's what that is. And Jesus has no rebuke for this church. Now go to the last church in 314. And to the angel of the church in Laodicea write, These things says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I can wish that you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I'm about to vomit you out of my mouth because you say, I am rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing, and you don't know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind and naked hmm so remember uh, when we saw um, the virgin who was not defiled in order to understand that well actually it works the opposite way if you go to um, chapter 3 the church of Sardis when Jesus says that you have a few names in Sardis who have not defiled their garments when you just read that, it's like, okay, what is this talking about? What's this defiled thing? Well, you go to chapter 14 and find out, okay, the same word appears there, spiritual virgins. 
So you get more of a context to kind of figure out what it's talking about. In the same way, it's like a, you, it helps each other. Like the seven letters help understand uh, the rest of the revelation. And those other chapters also help you understand what the chapter two and three are talking about. And th there are such uh, connections like, like that. So, uh, you saw the second church, they're physically poor, but they're spiritually rich. The last church, they're physically, materially, they're rich. But Jesus says, you're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Spiritually, they were doing terrible. There's no commendation. So that gives a hint that totally parallels what Jesus and the New Testament warns about. Wealth. All over the New Testament. A not very popular topic, but something that I have come to see so clearly. I mean, how many rich man and Lazarus? You know that. Jesus says, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom. You know that. Uh, Luke 6, 20 to 26. Blessed are you who are poor. Woe to you who are rich. Uh, James. James 2, 5. Has not God chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he promised to those who love him? I just quoted that. James, he knows the same thing. Uh, Jesus warns, Matthew 6, 24. Uh, that you can't have two masters. No one can have two masters. He will either love hate one love the other be loyal to one and despise the other you cannot serve god and wealth mammon so over and over and over the new testament warns very seriously and you see the exact same thing in revelation the church that was poor they're spiritually doing great but the church that's in a more wealthy area a laodicea it was a wealthy area they, they had good business and everything they're spiritually doing bad. And so this is a warning for pe people like us who live in a very wealthy area. We need to be very cautious. But what's amazing is I have, I don't know if I've ever, I mean, I maybe very few uh, sermons that uh, really go into this, but it's just so, there's supposed to be so many more warnings for us who live in such a wealthy context. Uh, but yeah, so when you keep reading Revelation 18, it's just very clear about like all the luxury and all that stuff that's connected to Babylon, um, the, dis the one that gets destroyed. And remember, you heard, my people come out of her. You can commit spiritual fornication. And so, I came to all this based on the 2 Corinthians 11, the spiritual virgins. Like Jesus said, wealth is one of the top candidates for idolatry, spiritual harlotry, spiritual fornication. We have to be so cautious. Apostle Paul knew the same thing. Uh, Ephesians 5.3 and 5.5, 5, that covetousness is idolatry. You can just read it. It says it. Paul warns about, you know, love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. 1 Timothy 6. Having food and clothing with these we shall be content. Those who desire to be rich fall into like various temptation and snare and this and that and fall away many times. It warns about it. So yeah, just, you know, I, I have, um, this is the first time in a long time where I have lived around uh i have been around like unbelievers some unbelievers and um it's just i'm amazed at how money is so like just their life i'm just amazed it's uh it's like the goal in life like it's just so so huge and i, I the bible just so makes sense and um actually both of them are professing Christians, but just 
it's it's amazing um, and uh, yeah so when it comes to um, what we ought to be cautious of our loyalty relying on God looking to him I'll, I'll just read the first Timothy 6 like 617 I mean I, I, I'll, I can read both since we're here but in 6 6 first Timothy 6 6 now godliness with contentment is great gain for we brought nothing into this world and we can carry nothing out and having food and clothing basic needs with these we shall be content but those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and harmful lusts which drown men into destruction and ruin for the love of money is root of all kinds of evil for which some have strayed from the, the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows and then in 17 charge those who are rich in this present age not to be proud or haughty nor to hope in uncertain riches but in God do you see this right here setting your hope in riches relying on riches and not on God see so guys um, if you know the Bible the Bible warns about the the political side too like during Isaiah's time and I mean all throughout the Kings remember uh, like Kings sometimes relying on uh, the allies other countries that'll be their like their their shield their protector God despises that remember Hezekiah where um, when Assyria was about to just absolutely destroy Jerusalem Hezekiah he just goes to God and he just falls down before God and says oh God basically for your namesake I you know we, we look to you we rely on you deliver us and God wipes out that Assyrian army on the other hand there's like occasions where the kings they rely on uh, like Syria and other Egypt sometimes and other countries around and God totally like just hates that that you're not relying on me and so the exact same principle applies with money like this verse says nor to set your hope in riches but in God money can so be a rival because uh, it can so function as God oh when when you have money oh I, I can get this and I can get anything with money that's why it's such a rival and that is why the New Testament I mean how many verses did I go to I, I didn't go to all the verses but just at the top of my head like Jesus James Paul yeah all over the place Revelation um, so it's such a top candidate for uh, idolatry not looking to Christ not looking to God and starting to trust in that and rely on that it's such a rival and our God is jealous God so uh, look if you're a pastor you so want to make sure the people I'm entrusted with I will do whatever I can of course you can't control people but I'll do whatever I can to make sure I teach these things and make sure my people that I'm entrusted with who's God's people I will try to do whatever I can to make sure they do not look to riches but they look to the Lord our God he can use a raven a raven to feed you if he needs to um, I mean you guys know my testimony what I shared this God can do anything and yet when his people they don't so look to the Lord but rely on other things that's terrible our God is a jealous God and uh, 
plenty of warnings, so many warnings all over the place. So, and, and then the other aspect, let me just cover one, one last part. Um, the other aspect is, you guys know James 4.4? 4? It says, adulteresses, adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever desires to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. So, James starts with the word, adulteresses. Now, if you have the biblical background, I mean, we, we've been covering this, right? Why adulteresses? Because, you know, the church is the bride. But when you have friendship with the world, that's hostility, that's enmity with God. So there is that other um, aspect. And the thing is, they kind of go together. The world... It's so like consumed, obsessed with money, uh, and um, so the world and like wealth. It's it's full of it, and uh, but yeah, James adulteresses. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? And uh, so that's the that's also another aspect of um, spiritual infidelity, spiritual um, harlotry, impurity where you get defiled with the world, the worldly things. And the same James, okay, James 1, 27, pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to watch over like orphans and widows in their trouble, and to keep oneself undefiled from the world. Did you hear that last part? To keep oneself undefiled or uncontaminated by the world so the same James who said in James 4 4 about adulteress's friendship with the world there's this spiritual contamination from the world so by the way we started out with 2nd Corinthians 11 this is why we're going into this but for Dina you can just read this but Paul says I'm jealous for you guys with the jealousy of God, for I betroth you guys to one husband, Christ, that I may present you as a chaste version to Christ. Paul is speaking about how his goal is to present the church as a chaste version to Christ for that wedding day, for them to be a spiritually chaste, pure virgin. And so I was going into, this whole time I've been going into, what's the opposite of that? Like what gets... Uh, what are the like the, the opposite aspects of uh, a chaste version? That's what we've been going over. And we saw like the same kind of virgin, spiritual virgin thing in Revelation. Uh, and that's another whole thing in Revelation 2. The whole world, the world is uh, ruled by the devil. The devil is uh, the ruler of this world. And there's uh, spiritual contamination, spiritual defilement. So, yeah, basically, we want to make sure, when it comes to being a chaste virgin, we want to make sure there's pure devotion to Christ and not looking to other idolatrous things, being cautious of wealth, which is totally connected to the world and things like that. One of the, I, I would say that's like the top candidate for um, spiritual adultery, um, along with... Uh, just a pagan world which is full of spiritual contamination if you're in second corinthians if you just go a little bit to the right to, to galatians 1 i mean look at this in galatians 1 verse 3 3 4 somebody want to read 3 4 Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father. Yeah, so it says, Christ who gave himself for our sins, so that what? That he might deliver us from this present evil age. It, it says the purpose of him giving himself for us is to deliver, deliver us from this present evil age. This evil age, the world... It's full of just all kinds of wickedness and spiritual defilement and yeah. So being so cautious of the world's influence 
It's so important, okay? It's so important, but it's just so neglected in the American church, Ser seriously. The worldliness. There is spiritual contamination, like James said right there in James 127 and many other passages. We saw Revelation 14, the defiled defilement thing, defiled their garments. That's worldly pollution from pagan, uh, you know, whether media, shows, movies, this and that, all kinds of um, defiling things. Um, Satan is the ruler of this world. He gets those things out. And uh, there is spiritual defilement that happens along with so many other things, a worldly influence. But so, uh, yeah, we didn't get to go to the Ephesians 5, but I can just quote it. The Ephesians 5.25 Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. Okay, listen. Christ loved the church and gave himself for her that he might sanctify, having cleansed her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself as a glorious church without having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So did you hear that? So um, the same kind of thing is being spoken of. That's why I put it next to each other. 2 Corinthians 11 and Ephesians 5. That Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. That he might sanctify having cleansed her with the washing of water by the word. Okay, if there's washing, it's implied that there's something to be washed from. Or there's something that needs to be washed away, right? Yeah, defilement stuff. That, that's implied. So... That he might sanctify, having cleansed her with the washing of water by the word, so that he might present her to himself a glorious church, without having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So it says that Christ is doing that with this church. But pastors are uh, the, the instruments through which... Uh, that gets done also in a way there's a sense in which Christ is doing that but pastors who are entrusted they have a huge function huge role in making sure uh, th these things are taught and you know they, they have this this goal like Paul did I want to make sure this church can be presented as a chaste version to Christ for that wedding day for her to be spiritually pure, devoted to the Lord. She does not look to any other man, no other idol, but she's devoted to Christ. That's absolutely like essential. I mean, pastor's goal, I mean, come on, that this, this flock that I'm pastoring, that they have no one else, that they're so devoted, uh, committed to him, Absolutely one of the top ones. Not this stupid church growth, whatever, ridiculous stuff, but the people that I'm entrusted with, that I shepherd uh, correctly uh, for that wedding day. Um, so, yeah, that's why Paul says it right there in uh, 2 Corinthians 11. Like, I'm afraid that, that just as the serpent, hmm, the devil comes in, Paul goes into Genesis, the serpent deceiving Eve, woman, church, kind of, there's a similarity. Just like the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be led astray from the, like, pure uh, devotion to Christ, sincere and pure devotion to Christ. Because the church was going astray by the false apostles. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, just... Uh, I hope this was uh, helpful and beneficial and any thoughts, um, questions? Yeah, so, yeah, today is just the yeah, 2 Corinthians 11 and um, so many passages. Uh, yeah, next week we'll see more, but um, yeah, Paul... Uh, he had that ambition, he had that jealousy, uh, wanting to present the church as a chaste virgin. 
And of course, that that wouldn't have been just with the Corinthian church, obviously. That's with all the churches, all Christians. So, you know, you can ask, um, are you looking forward? Well, let me back up. Do you know that you're a part of the bride of Christ? Are you? And if you are, are you looking forward to your bridegroom, your, your husband, not husband yet, but your groom's return? Uh, just like a virgin that is waiting for the groom to come and get you, are you in that place? Looking forward to his return and you're, you're keeping yourself spiritually pure, just like the physical purity of a woman. Uh, spiritual purity not being contaminated by the world or having any um like anything that would compete with christ um you're loyal to him no hint of any idol uh, you can just think about that and all right well uh unless any thoughts questions so uh, i guess i can pray and so Lord, thank you for this time. Uh, it's a blessing. Uh, I hope it's a blessing to all. Um, Lord, going over your word, just many passages of, of truth, uh, passages of your holy word uh, regarding the church and pastor's role and um, these amazing truths, Lord. Um, the bride of Christ awaiting the groom's return to get her. Lord, uh, May we have this in mind. Um, may we indeed uh, be this bride that you're working on, that you gave yourself for, um, in order to sanctify, and wash her, cleanse her, so that one day you present to yourself a glorious church without having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but holy and without blemish. Lord, I hope that is going on with all of us. And uh, Lord, um, it is very grievous when I see uh, various things, but please let there be uh, plenty of warnings that there ought to be, Lord. Would you raise up men that are indeed uh, prophets? So, Lord, uh, work in your church. Please bring a warning and admonition, Lord. And uh, may we be indeed a part of that uh, beautiful bride. And uh, one day, just standing there on that wedding day, Lord, as a part of it. So, uh, Lord, uh, be with um, others that weren't able to join and um, that just they are also a part of the, the, the bride, Lord. I you know, pray that that's the case. And uh, Lord, may we do our part of what we're given, Lord. So watch over us and grant us uh, good times with you, Lord, as those that are uh, purely just devoted to you. In Jesus' name, amen.